When it comes to property investing, I've always preached the importance of cash flow and return on investment. But have I been overlooking perhaps one of the most important and most powerful parts of property investing, which is capital growth. Put simply, capital growth is your property increasing in value over time. You can calculate this capital growth by finding the difference between your current market value of your investment and then the price that you initially purchased it for and obviously comparing the two. To give you an easy example of capital growth in action, a £100,000 property goes up in value 4% in a year, its new value is now £104,000. And in this video, I'm going to share with you why capital growth is perhaps one of the most important parts of property investing. And one of the many reasons that I coined the phrase, play the long game. You see, I don't want to contradict myself here. As an investor, it's my personal belief that we should always purchase properties based off of the monthly cash flow and the return on investment, rather than some kind of hypothetical belief that a property will increase in value in the future. I often hear sentences such as, it doesn't matter if the property only makes 80 pounds per month because it's a great area for capital growth, okay? Wrong, it definitely does matter and it can be a dangerous game to play, especially during the times of increasing interest rates and potential uncertainty ahead. So with that said, it's my belief that we should always be looking to maximize our cash flow and our return on investment, but whilst also purchasing properties in areas with good capital growth potential. And that is the trifecta of success in property, the three pillars which make a good investment. Now, before we move over to the whiteboard, what actually makes a property have good capital growth potential? Well, there are several factors, or you could say fundamentals, but the main three that we are looking at are the following. The UK wide fundamentals, the area specific fundamentals, and lastly, the property fundamentals. So if we start with UK wide, well, there's a few factors. Number one is supply versus demand, which is mainly impacted by the direction of the property market, depending on inflation and interest rates and a whole host of other things. Then we've got population density, which is the population versus the number of houses available or the number of new homes being built. Third, we've got the jobs, because of course, when large corporations such as the HMRC or large media companies, large distribution companies or warehouses like Amazon decide to relocate their premises and their staff, this can massively impact the areas and the demand in the years following. And lastly, our grants and schemes. A good example of this can be the current social housing contracts that are available for five to seven year leases. Areas which were previously not that desirable or populated have now seen an increase due to the different type of property strategies that are available to investors because of these grants and schemes. Plus there are many other factors, but these are the main fundamentals to consider. Next is the area specific ones because you've got transport links, for example. So how well connected is the town or the city? And is that infrastructure being improved? Amenities is next. So, you know, the access to the shops, the facilities, and what companies are kind of renting those premises locally. Typically, they always say, you know, if a co-op or a Waitrose or an M&S is being built nearby, then things are on the up, things are looking good. And then we've got schools, because of course, being in the right catchment areas is very important for families. And this can dramatically change the value of properties in or outside of those catchment areas. And perhaps most importantly on this list is the planned and future investment into the area. How much construction is there planned? You know, we can use this to really see the potential of when an area might be classed as up and coming, or we might see gentrification. And lastly, out of these three fundamentals is the property fundamentals. You see a one bedroom flat will not increase in value at the same rate as a three bedroom terraced house. It sounds obvious when you actually go and say it out loud, but this is often overlooked by new investors. It's believed and actually statistically proven, to be honest, that houses increase at a faster percentage rate over time, you know, over flats. And when we specifically look at flats, it's also thought that one or two bedroom flats are far more valuable than studio flats, given the additional 
flexibility and the additional space. So then if we then look at houses, it's often thought and believed that a three bedroom terraced property in let's say parts of the North make for the best vanilla buy to let investments as they rent or they sell to families and they offer more overall space with two bedrooms following closely behind that and then one bedroom houses being the least desirable. And that rounds up the three main fundamental factors to consider with capital growth. And whilst we're on this subject, you know, looking back to 2019, when I was plotting my first ever buy to let purchase, I was an amateur investor about to get started. I was actually going through this process without fully realizing it. I would look up the total value of predicted construction works in Liverpool city, because I thought, you know, if large developers were moving into this area, there was likely to be confidence and future growth. I would also review the sale and rental prices over the last, you know, five to 10 years to see if there were any trends or recent changes. And lastly, I would specifically analyze a house that was up for sale on Rightmove. I'd watch it all the way through to sold STC and then try to find out when it went through what it sold for. And the same with rent. I would watch a house listed, note the duration of time that it took to be let, and then I could determine how much demand there was for a two bed, let's say, versus a three bed. I could then do this postcode versus that postcode and you get the picture. Now it's at this point in the video that I wanted to share with you the true power of capital growth. And what do I actually mean by that when I say it? Well, quite often an investor will own a property for five years and then they would sit back and assess how profitable it has been by the amount of yearly profit it's made once all the expenses have been deducted. But there's actually another formula that not many people talk about. This is known as the total return formula. The total return of an investment includes both the capital growth and the income that this property generates. To put it simply, total return equals end value minus purchase value plus earnings in that period. Now, if we go over to the whiteboard, I can explain this in more detail. So we're back with Whitney the whiteboard and as I mentioned earlier in this video we are looking at the trifecta of property investing which is cash flow, return on investment and capital growth. And how can we calculate those? Well we can do it using the total return formula so that is what we're here to do, that's what we're here to look at. So in this example I've taken some very basic numbers, missed out some of the costs in order to keep it very simple. But let's start with the house price, the property price let's say in this example is £100,000. So if we go out, we buy that buy to let, it's worth £100,000, we buy it for that price. We obviously have a deposit of £25,000, which is a 25% deposit, and then you get a buy to let mortgage. We've then got stamp duty land tax, so stamp duty plus fees, which would be solicitors, survey, etc., coming in at 6,000. That's a little bit high, but there's, there's over budget here, £6,000 there. We've got updates to the property. Maybe it needs some things doing to it in order to get it to a state in which we can rent it. 4,000 pounds, totaling 35,000 pounds. And we can be expecting that if we are gonna go out and buy a house for 100,000 pounds as a buy to let, we are probably gonna be tying up somewhere between you know, 30 and 36,000 pounds, depending on these extras here. So in this example, 35,000 pounds worth of capital tied in. Now, along the way, I'm gonna miss some things, but as I've said, I'm keeping the numbers simple, simple numbers for a simple person like me. Now, moving forward, this is the part where we're actually gonna work out the return on investment and then the total return formula. So if we say that we buy this and when we own this house for one year, in that year, the first year of profit, we are gonna say is three, thousand pounds. Now, if we work out the ROI based on this 3,000 pounds, we're looking at about eight and a half percent. That's because we've had the rent come in, we've deducted all of those expenses, and we've made about 3,000 pounds in profit, and we take our profit and of course divide it by the amount of money we've invested into this deal, giving us eight and a half percent in return on investment. And that's quite typical right now, given the interest rates, given all the costs you have to factor in. But now let's actually look at what growth we might see. If we actually say that in that same year, this property, this area went up in growth and maybe went up, let's say 4%, we're now looking at an additional 4,000 pounds in equity. So if we actually sold this property at now 104,000 pounds, 
That is additional money that we've made, we've got in our pocket, and likewise if we went to refinance it. So now we've made 3,000 in profit, 4,000 pounds in equity, so our total profit and growth is 7, pounds and based off of this seven thousand pounds we can now work out our total return percentage which is now 20 percent so now we are in a position which we can fully evaluate this house not just off of the rental but off of the total profit and the growth that we've seen in year one now this is example one i'm now going to move over to example two so now let's move on to example two and in this example we're going to be using the same numbers so a hundred thousand pounds purchase price for the house the total capital invested thirty five thousand pounds and if you've forgotten the numbers scroll back in the video a little bit watch that first bit and then return to this but in this example i'm going to slightly dull down those numbers and the reason i'm going to dull them down is because maybe i've been a bit too optimistic in saying that these houses are going to earn three thousand pounds a month in profit consistently because maybe you know the interest rate rises have killed some of that profit maybe obviously maintenance and certain issues that come up along the way have killed some of those profits so let's actually say in this example year one the profit is two thousand pounds not three thousand pounds two thousand pounds and then let's say that it does that consistently on average two thousand pounds a year for the next five years we now know that this property is gonna make us 10,000 pounds in profit over the next five years. If we then look at the capital growth, and let's say, let's dull it down, let's say 2% per year, which is perhaps more realistic considering over the next five years, we might have some years which are you know, much higher, and then we might have some years where we plateau or in fact we dip down. But let's say on average, it goes up 2% per year for the next five years. Well, of course, if it does 2% per year, you might be thinking, well, that's just 2,000 pounds per year. But remember, there's compounding here. So if the property goes up to 102,000 after year one, and then it does 2% on that, it's not actually just a straight 2,000 every year. So just remember compounding, there's like calculators online if you wanna just shortcut it and work it out. But the five years of 2% of per year works out as 10,000, 408 pounds in capital growth, giving you a new value of 110,408 pounds. So we've now got a total return of, you know, that profit plus that growth over five years, meaning that this property over a five year span has made us 20,408 pounds. And now when we look at that 20,000 408 pounds in new created value, which could either stay in the business, it could be refinanced out of the property into the business, it could be the property could be sold, we could take that money, bank it, and obviously pay the necessary taxes we need to. But whatever we do with it, that new value of 20,408 pounds, when we compare that against the initial capital invested of 35,000 pounds, means that we've now made a 58% return on our money. Now, love it or hate it, that is the total return formula. And in property, it is the capital growth which is so silent, yet is so incredibly powerful. And if Warren Buffett was here and he was talking about the compound effect in property, you know, this is what he would be talking about and how effective that capital growth can be when it compounds over a long period of time. It's the fact that you can go out and you can purchase a £100,000 property. You can then own and rent that out for 10 years and then sell it at the end for £125,000. And you'll not only will you make that money, but you will have a deposit in there of £25,000 that you can take out. That property might earn you, you know, 30,000 pounds in rent over the 10 years. And now you've got that new equity uh, from the capital growth of 25,000 pounds. So that in itself totals 80,000 pounds of created value. And you've done that over 10 years. Now do that with a portfolio of five houses. And all of a sudden you can see how people create large, large amounts of wealth through property. And that folks is the total return formula. That is the capital growth. I'm interested to hear what you think. So any questions, any comments, chuck them below and I'll see you in next week's video.